Okay, um, we have an exam on Friday. Just to remind you, I hope all of you know that and have been studying all weekend and are continuing to study. Uh, so there will be assigned seats for the exam. Uh, you, uh, I'll post those on EEE gradebook later today. Uh, if you'd like to request a left-handed seat, show up 10 minutes early and talk to the TA here who will have the seating assignments and they can do something for you. Um, that means bring your ID because we have assigned seats, we'll check those, um, so don't forget that. And there is no discussion section on Friday, so if you have a Friday discussion section, um, then try to make it to one of the other discussion sections this week. And again, we have extra office hours this week, check the website, uh, you can check when those extra office hours are. Uh, I have extra office hours today, for example, instead of just Thursday. Um, okay, so uh, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about stuff that I see in the news that relates to organic chemistry. And um, So here was a recent article on Gatorade. I'm sure a lot of you probably drink Gatorade sometimes. They came out with this, I'm not really an expert on Gatorade, this newer version that seems to be have natural ingredients as opposed to the total, totally synthetic ingredients in their regular uh, mix. Um, but what was fascinating is this story is about them taking out some uh, traditional ingredient that they've been using in their formulation called brominated vegetable oil. And just for me to hear the word or read the word brominated turns me on that something interesting is going on there. Um, so apparently there's quite a few uh, types of beverages that contain brominated vegetable oil and I was totally unaware of that. And what they're pointing out is that the ingredient is being used as an emulsifier. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly correct, but, uh, but you get the idea. So let's go ahead and talk about what brominated vegetable oil is doing um, in Gatorade or whatever drinks that they're putting in there. What, what's also fascinating to me is apparently this, um, there's a Mississippi teenager who was making all kinds of noise about this saying, hey, how come you're putting brominated vegetable oil into my drink? Take that stuff out of there. So this seems to be uh, catching on. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about what happens if you take natural citrus fruit or citrus oils and you mix them in with a drink. If you've ever taken an orange peel and squeezed it sort of backwards, you'll see this little spray come out. It's full of all kinds of organic compounds that taste and smell phenomenal. And it would be great to make drinks where you can take advantage of those citrus oils. And of course they do that. Um, the problem with oils, organic compounds, is they don't mix with water. If you take any organic compound that exists in a liquid form uh, and you try to mix it with water, the tiny little bubbles that form, like I don't know if you can see the laser point here, you'll have these tiny little bubbles. Even if you mix it really well, all the tiny little bubbles are lighter than water. Organic compounds are less dense than water and they will all float to the surface. And that's not very appetizing if you're drinking your Gatorade and all the organic flavoring oils have risen to the top and form some oily sheen that you drink up in the first sip. Um, so what they do is they put in com uh, a class of compounds called emulsifiers to help make, to spread out all the organic droplets. But the problem is all these little organic droplets still have a tendency to rise because they're less dense than water. And so what can you do if your oily flavored droplets are less dense than water? If all those citrus oils, those organic compounds are rising to the surface, some very clever person said, well, if we take soybean oil, sold as vegetable oil in, in the department, in the grocery store, and we brominate that using a reaction that you learned in the last chapter, bromine is very heavy. You've probably never picked up a bottle of bromine, but the second you grab it, you realize, oh my gosh, this is heavy stuff. Um, when you brominate organic molecules, they start to become more dense and heavier. And brominated vegetable oil is heavy and dense. It's got a typical density for the stuff that they sell for these applications is around 1.3 grams per mil. So when you mix this brominated vegetable oil in this drink, it goes into these little droplets and, and you can adjust it so that the density of these little droplets is exactly the same as water. So that they don't all rise to the surface and so these delicious flavored uh, organic compounds stay dispersed throughout your mix. Um, so they're going to take this out of Gatorade and put in other dense organic molecules that have more oxygens instead of a few bromines. Um, and sort of an interesting application I'd never heard of uh, for bromination reactions that, that you've been, and you've been drinking those compounds without knowing it. 
Okay, so uh, we've moved on from chapter, chapter 10, which was these bromination reactions. Uh, I guess we're going to cover some in chapter 11, so let's move on to chapter 11 now. So uh, again, the exam on Friday will only cover chapters 9 and 10. Well, of course, there will be SN1 and SN2 stuff from earlier chapters. Organic chemistry is always intrinsically cumulative, but of course, the, the test will focus on chapters 9 and 10. There's no chapter 11 alkyne stuff. It, it, um, um, there's no new stuff from chapter 11 on the exam. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and, uh, what did we talk about on, on before we left on Monday? What, basically what I said is, look, alkynes, CC triple bonds have, um, have pi bonds in them, and they're going to act as nucleophiles just like CC pi bonds um, in, um, in, in just regular alkenes. But let's go ahead and front end our, our conversation by, by introducing a little nomenclature, and not really IUPAC nomenclature, um, but just regular nomenclature, uh, just how I'm going to refer to these compounds. So let me start off by drawing two different uh, alkynes, because there's an important distinction I'm going to make throughout this chapter. So I'm going to start off with a four carbon alkyne, where the CC triple bond is at the end of the alkyne. And then I'll compare that with another four carbon alkyne, where the CC triple bond is in the middle. So four carbons, that's butane. Uh, but these are both butynes, right? Butane has no uh, unsaturation in it. This clearly has an alkyne. So let me write butyne here. And if the highest priority functional group is an alkyne, um, then the name will end in ine, sort of as an indicator. This would be one butyne. You number, in IUPAC, you number so that the high priority functional group has the lowest number possible. That would be one butyne. So you wouldn't count the other direction and make it three butyne. And over here, it's, it's arbitrary which side I start from. No matter which side I start numbering from, this particular butyne will be two butyne. So that's IUPAC nomenclature. And I think there's a couple of questions on the sapling homework. I don't ask IUPAC nomenclature on my exams, but I might ask you a question where I say, synthesize the following internal alkyne or terminal alkyne. And those are phrases I, I want you to know because I'll use them. They're kind of useful phrases. So what, how would I distinguish this alkyne that has a CH at the end versus an alkyne that has alkyl groups at the end? So this we call a terminal alkyne. That means it's at the end of the molecule. And there's all kinds of distinctive chemistry related to that. So that's why I want you to know what a terminal alkyne is when I refer to that. And this other one where there's alkyl groups at the ends, in other words, when the al alkyne triple bond is in the middle of a chain, we call this an internal alkyne. Okay, so I want you to know, um, know that kind of nomenclature in case, I, in case I'm writing on my overheads here and I refer to those terms. Okay, so, uh, you know, as far as physical properties, there's not a whole lot for us to say about uh, alkynes. I'll simply point out that the alkyne functional group is, is it's not like uh, there's oxygen or some sort of electronegative atom on there. So you can expect that, that any alkyne functional group is not going to introduce polarity to a molecule. So let me draw out a series of six carbon molecules. There's hexane, it's a common solvent in organic synthesis and organic chemistry. Uh, we use that um, for chromatography, specifically because it's nonpolar. And so I'll just write out here hexane so we can compare that. And so let's imagine adding an alkene to that, introduce some unsaturation, that would be hexene, specifically one hexene, I'm not going to uh, worry about that. And now let me draw a four carbon chain, there's three carbons, four, five, and six carbons. So this would be one hexine, and if we compare the boiling points of these molecules, they all have about the same boiling point. Same sort of range. Boiling points are around 60 to 80 degrees for these Celsius. Okay, so they're, they're greasy molecules. If you have alkynes, they don't, they don't make the, the molecule any more polar um, than, than any other um, than any other carbon, simple carbon-based functional group. 
So in other words, there's all these sections in the book that talk about the naming of alkynes. I'm not going to ask you IUPAC nomenclature. The properties of alkynes, and there's not a whole lot to discuss as far as hydrogen bonding or boiling points. And then in section 11.4, they talk about examples of alkynes. And I would encourage you to read through that section just to understand why should I spend time learning about alkynes? Um, but I'm not going to ask you to draw any of those structures on the exam. Um, you know, I think they may talk about some, uh, uh, um, a frog toxin called histrionica toxin or a, the birth control uh, compound ethyl estradiol. But again, I don't ask you to memorize organic structures, complex organic structures, just so you can repeat them back to me on the exam. Okay, so a lot of stuff in those three sections that is not really um, the kind of stuff that I, I want you to walk away from this class with. Uh, I'd like you to walk away from this class understanding the chemistry of atoms and uh, of organic molecules at the level of atoms and bonds. So let's talk about some chemical reactions. So how do you make alkynes? Let's go ahead and start off right out the gate here with a reaction that you haven't quite seen before. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two different elimination reactions that you could use um, to make alkynes. And so I'll, I'll finish up this structure in just one moment. And I'll show you a reaction where you take a strong base, an immensely powerful base. So you can see I've got two isopropyl groups. And in between these two isopropyl groups, I've got two carbons. And so if, if I want to make an alkyne, I can't just have a single bromine atom there. Because if I treat this with a base, all I'll get is an alkene. So here's one way to make an alkyne, is you have to have two BRs. So we can eliminate HBr twice. So if we do two eliminations of HBr. And we're going to want, want to use some powerfully basic conditions in order to make this happen. And so in this particular case, we have to eliminate HBr once and then twice. We do that all in the same pot. And so we're going to add two equivalents of a very powerful base, sodium amide, NaNH2. And get ready to start using that throughout this chapter. Wow, that's basic. God, that is so basic. We'll talk about that. It's super basic, sodium amide. So again, what you can't see, and I'll, I'll draw it for you. And I want to draw it small because typically I wouldn't draw these hydrogen atoms for you. But I'm just going to remind you that there's a hydrogen atom here. And then there's a hydrogen atom down here. And so you're losing two HBRs. You're just doing two E2 eliminations. We'll talk about this um, more in just a little bit. OK, so what's another type of substrate you could use to make an alkyne? I'll draw another halide here. And you could do the same two equivalents of sodium amide base. <clears throat> you know, in terms of nomenclature, that you would call that amide, sodium amide. But I try to emphasize with the word amide because there's another functional group called an amide, and I don't want to distinguish that. So if it irritates you, just get over it <laughs> that I'm calling it amide. Chemists might say, gee, why are you distorting the name like that? And so I'm going to write potassium dibutoxide. The book writes the, the molecular formula, the structural formula out. But you'll find I'm going to start abbreviating potassium dibutoxide like this. And so I'll expect you to know that that means dibutoxide. So tert butyl alkoxide anion. Or I might draw TBO potassium. Um, but this is potassium tbutoxide that you've already seen a lot of. Now, as we will see shortly, potassium tbutoxide is nowhere near as powerful as sodium amide. So whether the book does it or not, if you're trying to make an alkyne with potassium tbutoxide, I want you to draw heat. Potassium tbutoxide is nowhere near as, as basic as sodium amide. So I would like you to draw heat. And typically, the temperatures required are 80 to 100 degrees, a little over 100 degrees. So if we eliminate here, there's, two, there's a two carbon chain dangling off of this benzene ring. So I'm going to end up with a two carbon alkyne dangling off of that benzene ring. And again, you may not be able to see here where those two, eight, you're going to eliminate HCl twice in this reaction. Here's two of the three H's on that uh, 
on that carbon atom at the end. So, okay, so two different reactions. You could use either one of these, two, uh, uh, two equivalents of sodium amide or two equivalents of a potassium TB toxide. Don't forget to heat that. Um, so you can see that these two types of substrates are subtly different. So on the top substrate, I've got uh, the two bromines on different carbons, on neighboring carbons. And we have a term for that when the two halogens are on neighboring carbons. This is what you get when you add bromine across a double bond. So you already know how to make substrates like this. We call this a vicinal dibromide. And that means they're on neighboring carbons. And down over here, where the two halogens are on the same carbon, we call that geminal, a geminal dibromide. And I may use that terminology. I may say, oh, if you add two equivalents of HCl to an alkyne, you get a geminal dibromide. So I expect you to understand the distinction between a geminal uh, dihalide and a vicinal dihalide. You already know how to make vicinal dibromides just by adding Br2 across double bonds, just like that brominated vegetable oil. Yes? Dichloride, do whatever I say. <laughs> if I said di dibromide here, I meant dichloride. Yeah, geminal dichlor. Oh, 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 here, yes. Ah, yeah. Dichloride, thank you. Geminal dichloride. Okay, so let's talk about these two conditions. You need powerfully basic conditions to do these el double elimination reactions. Um, and those powerful conditions are, uh, are worth talking about. Amide anion bases. Boy, those are going to be super important. Uh, not sodium amide, but lithium amide bases when you get to chapter 23 and 24. And in modern organic synthesis. So I really want you to start getting used to this sodium amide, even though it looks strange. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, take an example where we're doing another one of these elimination reactions. And I want to just focus in on this uh, so here would be yet one more example of doing a, a double elimination to make an alkyne. So there's my substrate. And I'll eliminate H and Br from one side and H and Br from the other side. And let's talk about these fancy new conditions with the two equivalents um, of sodium amide. Don't write EQ as EQ. Don't write EQ for equivalence. That means equation. <laughs> um, that's the abbreviation for equation. I didn't invent that system, but <laughs> you have to write equiv all the way out. The, the American Chemical Society decided on, on the, that abbreviation system. Okay, so this would be a way to synthesize an alkyne from this two carbon piece. And this would give a terminal alkyne. Um, Pretty sweet reaction there, and I promise you that will be on this, some form of this reaction will be on some exam in every single section of Chem 51C. So this, these types of elimination reactions are totally money reactions. And I'll explain why later it's so useful to make uh, alkynes and specifically terminal alkynes. Okay, let's talk about the basicity of these conditions. And it's like, what's the deal with potassium t-butoxide and the heat? And what I want to do is I want to draw a, a typical series of compounds slash functional groups so we can talk about the basicity of those. So let's compare ammonia. That's pretty nucleophilic and pretty basic. You'll have a whole chapter on amines and ammonia uh, coming up later in the book, much later in the book, I think around chapter 27. Um, and I want to compare a series of, of compounds that you may have seen used as basis. And we'll compare these with this amide anion. And so let's come back over here and compare that with an amide anion. There it is. Right? It looks kind of like ammonia, except for that minus charge there. So let's go ahead and compare the relative basicities here. Um, and I'll write this out. Relative basicity. You can get this by looking up the pKa's of the conjugate acids. There's a pKa table in the back of the book. Okay, just by knowing that the pKa of an ammonium ion, if I stick a proton back on there, is 10 and the pKa of water is 16, I, I would know from that, that the relative basicities of ammonia versus hydroxide anion are about one 
uh, to a million. So hydroxide anion is a million times more basic than ammonia. A million times more basic. That's a huge difference in basicity. So, so far in this, in, in this book and in the Kim 51 series, you haven't been using amines as bases a lot. They've gone straight to hydroxide anions. I forgot to put this minus charge on T-butoxide over here. Um, and so how much more basic is T-butoxide than hydroxide? Um, it's actually 100 times more basic. So relative to ammonia, T-butoxide is 100 million times more basic than ammonia. See, you, you, it's not just that it's sterically hindered relative to hydroxide. It's also more powerful by a factor of 100. But you know what? If you ask a typical organic chemist about the relative basicity of hydroxide and T-butoxide, most organic chemists would tell you, oh, that's about the same basicity. Factor of 100 is just, that's nothing. Let's talk about the relative basicity of sodium amide. I think there's 20, does it matter how many zeros? I think there's 23 zeros there. Right, you, you can't just write 10 to the 23. You won't get a sense for how much more basic it is. So when I want a base, a powerful base in organic chemistry, I, I don't go to the shelf and grab a bottle of T-butoxide. Right, I, I go buy, I go get some sort of amide anion base. So once you see that, now you can sort of see why I oftentimes say, oh, hydroxide, T-butoxide, those are pretty similar, right? Compare that with an amide anion. So I want you to respect the huge basicity of an amide anion. It's also more nucleophilic than these others, but it's such a powerful base, you never see it do nucleophilic reactions. It always grabs protons first. Okay, so yes, you can use T-butoxide to eliminate to make alkynes if you want, but I want you to heat if you're doing that. With sodium amide, obviously, you don't need to heat that. You typically need to cool those reactions down so they don't go exothermic on you. Um, wow, so powerful basicity. And we'll use it for two completely different reactions in this chapter, sodium amide anion. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this regio, uh, about this elimination reaction to make alkynes. It's an E2 elimination reaction. So let me draw out a substrate with a geminal dichloride in there. So here's the geminal dichloride functional group. And you can see uh, that carbon that has the two halogens on there, there's an ethyl group on one side and a propyl group on the other. So if I come, that means both sides are not equivalent. So if I come along and employ my, I'm so excited about my super new sodium amide anion base, and let's throw, suppose I add in two equivalents of sodium amide, NaNH2. I'll get two different products out of this reaction. Let me draw those hydrogen atoms here, just so we can be clear about the fact that there's hydrogen atoms on both sides. So ultimately, the, the reaction is an E2 elimination reaction twice over. Um, and so what's happening is the amide anion base, I'll go ahead and draw that in here. I'm not going to draw the full mechanism. Here's my amide anion base, super basic. Wow, super duper basic. It can come in and do an E2 elimination on either side and it doesn't care, right? Here's one way it can, it can go. That would be the first elimination. And I'm not going to draw the intermediate, but amide anion doesn't know the difference. It's, it sees two sets of hydrogens. It's, it's not going to make any distinction between those. So as a result, let me redraw my six carbon chain here. One, two, three, four, five, six. What I find is people very often um, make a mistake in drawing out where, how many carbons there are. So I'm going to just draw the triple bond, even though this is distorted in a really ugly way. Um, it's kind of hurting me to see an alkyne without 180 degree bond angles, but I'm just so adamant that you have some tool at your disposal that helps you to not forget to put in one of the carbons. So let me draw another six carbon chain so I don't forget to draw any of the carbons here. No, I might have drawn the wrong number of carbons here. <laughs> yeah, I've got an extra carbon, so you have to just 
erase that from your mind there, that other carbon atom. So you can't really stop this from eliminating in the other way, and that would be to put the alkyne on the other side. So you could have done another two eliminations of HCl if the amide came and deprotonated on the other side. In other words, you would get a one-to-one -one mixture of these. If you had isopropyl on, yeah? Uh, so the, the question is, why wouldn't you form this? Is that your question? Yeah, that's called an alene. Um, and there's a secret to this reaction, and that is that it's under equilibrating conditions. <laughs> and you'd actually get some of this initially, um, but it'll equilibrate to this. And I'm just simply going to tell you, don't worry about that. Just assume that it never forms like we never discussed it. And thank you for asking about that. <laughs> so good question. And it does happen to some extent. Um, but it'll end up isomerizing over to the alkyne. And you don't need to know anything about that. OK, so, um, so there's this issue of regio control. This is typically why I would never try to use this reaction on, uh, to make an internal alkyne. It's this lack of regio control when you do elimination reactions from geminal uh, dihalides. So again, if I ask you what's the product of this, because they're basically in a one-to-one -one mixture, there is no major product. You have to write both of them. That's awful when there's no major product. OK, so I just showed you how to make alkynes. You've really got just one reaction. That's double E2 elimination with either sodium amide or potassium T-butoxide and heat. OK, so let's talk about what you can do with alkynes. Remember, there were five reactions I, that we learned uh, back in Chapter 10 where we added things to alkenes. We added HCl and HBr to alkenes. We added halogens like bromine like brominated vegetable oil and chlorine, Cl2, to alkenes. We made bromohydrins. We did hydration reactions with sulfuric acid and water. We did hydroboration oxidation. We're going to do four of those reactions without alkynes. We're not going to do the bromohydrin or chlorohydrin formation. But the other four same reagents, we're going to apply those same reagents to alkynes. Um, and so let's start doing that. I'm just going to walk you through those same four reagents. Hopefully. Um, you may think, God, this is boring. It's the same stuff. I okay, but it's at least good practice to learn it again in the context of alkynes. So let's go ahead and start off. And it adds a little bit of a twist, the fact that there's two pi bonds um, in an alkyne. Okay, so here's a four carbon alkyne, um, butyne. And if we come along and add HBr to this, and in this particular case, I'm going to write out adding two equivalents of HBr. So we can add HBr across the pi bonds of this alkyne in the same way that you can add HBr across the pi bond of an alkene. And what you can't be sure of yet until we discuss it is where those two bromines end up. So one of them will end up at the more substituted carbon. Ah, it's Markonikov addition. Where does the second bromine end up? So we're adding HBr. You can't quite tell, but I added an H over here. I'll draw the H that I drew. So the first addition goes here. Where does the second HBr go? And it turns out the second HBr go with the same regiochemistry. So you end up with the geminal dibromide when you add two equivalents of hydrohalic acid across an alkyne double bond. OK, so let's walk through the, the intermediates that are forming in this reaction. Um, so initially, what's happening? <clears throat> uh, let me go ahead and draw out the a mechanism for this to get us started. Is we'll end up adding HBr across this double bond, and I'll talk about the ca the carbocation. So get ready to be freaked out here. So let me just skip that mechanistic intermediate, just momentarily. And after this second addition of, of Br minus, um, initially we're going to have this intermediate in the reaction. If you wanted, you could stop the reaction at this stage where you've added just one equivalent of HBr across this double bond. Right? You've added one equivalent of HBr across the double bond. You could stop just by adding one equivalent. Um, more commonly in the book, they get you to add the second equivalent of HBr 
to make the geminal dibromide, which you can then use to make um, alkynes through dehydrohalogenation reactions. Okay, we'll come back to the carbocation intermediate that you generate in just a moment. Um, I don't want to freak you out with that um, immediately, but it's going to be very freaky. Get ready. Okay, so you can add HBr across double bonds. You can add two equivalents of HBr across double bonds. <clears throat> and guess what? HCl, it's the same thing. So <laughs> I'm not going to redraw an example for you where you add HCl across a double bond or a triple bond. You get that idea. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So that's one of the reactions we're going to learn with alkynes. Um, let's talk about another common reaction that you're going to see over and over with alkynes that's related to the, the um, that's related to that sodium amide that we just uh, talked about. So it's just general reactivity. Whenever I see an alkyne, there's two things I want to do with it. I want to add things across the pi bonds and I also want to convert it into a nucleophile. So we're going to talk about four different reactions where we add electrophiles across the double bond and then we're going to introduce one new reaction that's nothing like alkene chemistry. And here's that new reaction. And it's a reaction that is specific to terminal alkynes that have a CH at the end. And you are going to use this and use this and use this and overuse it. Um, for the next nine chapters until we show you some really good nucleophiles. So if you take sodium amide and you add it to a terminal alkyne, remember I showed you you could use sodium amides to do E2 eliminations um, uh, of vicinal dibromides or dihalides and geminal dihalides, but if you have a terminal alkyne that's already there and you treat that with sodium amide, this is such a powerful base, this amide anion, that it will rip off this proton from the end. Let me draw that lone pair here and I'll put minus here next to my amide anion and plus next to the sodium. Here's what happens. Remember how basic that sodium amide anion is? And you haven't seen anything like this before. Wow. That is powerful stuff. I, I'm pretty sure this is the only case so far where you have seen that we deprotonate any kind of a carbon atom in order to make um, a carbanion nucleophile. And that's the point of doing this, is that is now a carbanion nucleophile. There's sodium floating around and look at this. The byproduct of that process is ammonia and you may be super tempted to want to pull the proton off of that ammonia and go back in the other direction, but it doesn't work that way. The equilibrium lies on the side of this um, of this alkynyl anion. We'll talk about this, it's called an acetylide anion. So this is what, you, this is the point of this, is you'll make um, this super powerful carbon nucleophile and we're going to show you that you can use that to make carbon-carbon bonds. Okay, so two types of reactivity for alkynes. The, the triple bond itself here acts as a nucleophile and adds to things like Br2, HCl, hydration reactions. Um, and then this, the other pattern of reactivity is with terminal alkynes that we can deprotonate them to make super powerful carbon nucleophiles so that you can construct um, organic compounds. You can use this as a way to synthesize very large organic compounds in chapters 11 through 20. Okay, when we get to chapter 20 and from then on, you're going to stop using these because we'll show you a much more powerful set um, of carbon nucleophiles where you have carbon magnesium bonds and carbon lithium bonds. Um, but until then, this is all you've got. And as I said, the book over uses that because once, <laughs> once you get to chapter 20, you're never going to talk about those again because <laughs> we got so, something that's so much better. Okay, so let's talk about this uh, in detail. Let's talk about this addition of HX, HBr, and HCl across triple bonds. I, I was. I was afraid to talk about that carbocation intermediate, <clears throat> but now I don't want to be afraid to talk about that carbocation intermediate. So here, let me come back to that four carbon chain that I drew before. This is butyne. Doesn't matter that it's a, that it's a terminal alkyne. Um, remember we said that these undergo Markovnikov addition, that the mode of addition puts, uh, puts the proton at the less substituted position and the nucleophile will end up at the more substituted position. 
So if I draw out a mechanism for this reaction where I add HCl, so I guess if I drew the reaction, I would draw HCl above the arrow. And the initial product of this, re of this reaction where you have Markonikov addition would put the, ha the halogen nucleophile at the more substituted position. And um, I'll, I'll draw the H. There's two H's here. Um, but I'll draw one of them there for you so you can see we added HCl across the double bond. So notice that the chlorine doesn't end up on carbon one. It ends up on carbon two. Okay, so let's draw the arrow pushing mechanism here for this reaction. It's just like alkenes. You, you take an arrow and you show that one of these two pi bonds in the alkyne, there's two pi bonds there, attacks the proton, acts as a base and deprotonates HCl. And you can't tell where I'm going to stick that proton yet. Well, I guess you can look at the product and tell. Uh, but let's draw that intermediate. <coughs> Here's the carbon atom that's left over there, and there's the ethyl group that's sticking off. You've never seen anything like this before, right? Uh, so if that looks really freaky to you, good. I want that to look really freaky. And the next, you can guess what's going to happen on the next step here. I've got chloride anion floating around and it's going to come in and do a nucleophilic attack. So overall, if you can get over this weird looking carbocation intermediate, this is just like we saw in the last chapter where we took alkenes and added HX across the alkenes. So let's talk about this intermediate. We call this a vinyl cation. It's not called WTF, but let me just, uh, Let's talk about vinyl cations because I hope you've never drawn this before. If you've drawn this before now, then it was a huge mistake on your part. And it's the same idea if you, had, if you add HBr. You'll also generate the same vinyl cation intermediate. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I don't want you to get all excited about vinyl cations because they are very unusual. So let's talk about vinyl cations. <clears throat> So I'm going to draw out this, this vinyl cation here and I'll talk about two potential approaches to make a vinyl cation. I'm using a little dot there to represent the carbon. Actually, let me draw an, or, an empty P orbital there. That'll make me feel more comfortable. Okay, so there's my vinyl cation intermediate. And the way I just showed you to make those is to take some sort of an alkyne. You could have R groups on both sides of the alkyne. And you add HX across that, some sort of an acid. And yes, it could be sulfuric acid that protonates that. It does, you know, it's the same idea. So this is okay. And it has to do with the fact that an alkyne function group has an intrinsic instability and reactivity associated with it. But here's what I don't want you to ever do. I don't want you to ever think that you can take some sort of a, a vinyl halide and do an SN1 reaction. Here, let me just draw a dashed arrow. And I'll just write no. Not just no, but never. So a vinyl halides, you never do SN1 and you never do SN2. You don't know any mechanisms yet by which you can substitute a vinyl halide with a nucleophile. So why is it that you can make vinyl cations from alkynes but not from vinyl halides? It's simply because alkynes are a more reactive type of functional group. They want to react and do things. So I, I hope you already knew that and if not, let me just emphasize that. How do you make vinyl cations? Here's some substrates that, um, typical substrates that you're going to see in this chapter and in coming chapters where you're going to want to do chemistry with the halogens. Here I'll put a tosylate on there. Look at those great leaving groups. 
boy, the book made such a big deal about what great leaving groups halogens are in chapters um, 7 and 8. That was the whole focus of the chapters. And yet, even though those are great leaving groups, when can you do this? Never. I'll just write, no, don't do that. Right? You can't generate a vinyl cation that way. When can you do this? No, never, not ever. Oh, guess what? On this benzene ring? No. Yeah, I don't, do I need to, I hope I don't have to keep, don't. <clears throat> so you have to resist this temptation. Your temptation will be, oh yeah, Van Franken says van, vinyl cations, they form easily from any, no. Just when you protonate an alkyne. You can't do SN2 reactions, so let me just super emphasize this, that there is no mechanism of, of substitution that you yet know that allows you to substitute. So in other words, it's not just SN1 you can't do, you also can't do SN2 on, on vinyl halides. <clears throat> it's not that you can't do chemistry with vinyl halides, but not SN1 and SN2 business. Okay, so vinyl cations, no problem if you start with an alkyne, um, but don't try to do substitution reactions. Um, <clears throat> through SN1 or SN2 on, on vinyl halides. They're special. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this HX business. Addition of, of hydrohalic acids across alkynes. And, and I'll draw maybe a, a more full mechanism here. This time I'll take an internal alkyne. <clears throat> also a butyne, but this time it's internal, it's 2-butyne. And so if we add uh, two equivalents of HCl, as I just showed you before, because my substrate is symmetrical, there's a methyl group on one side, there's a methyl group on the other, I, I don't have to worry about regiochemistry issues. But remember, when you add HX, the two Xs, the two halogens end up on the same carbon. And I'm not going to draw where the two H's went. I hope you can see that they're over here on this carbon that's a CH2 group. You could also have made this same product by taking a vinyl halide. If somebody gave you a vinyl halide and said, here you go, here's a vinyl halide, you could also add HCl to that and it'll give you the same um, just by adding one equivalent of HCl. So if there's, a, if there's a halogen already, if you already have a vinyl halide, you can add HCl across that, that pi bond. Okay, so let's talk about these intermediates. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through the mechanism with the, um, uh, with, with the first addition of HCl across that double bond. It goes through a, a, a vinyl cation intermediate. But the first addition will give me H and Cl added across that double bond. And you get a mixture of E and Z isomers here. When you add one equivalent of HCl, you also get, so this, this has the high priority group here is chlorine, and the high priority group on this other carbon is methyl, and those are opposite sides. So this is the E isomer. Let me just write that there. This is the E isomer of the alkene. And you will also get an equivalent amount of the Z isomer, where the chlorine and the methyl are on opposite sides. And that's because the chlorine attacks from both sides of the vinyl cation, both ends of the p orbital on the vinyl cation. So you'll get a mixture of isomers. That's not very useful. And that's typically why people don't just add one equivalent uh, of HX to an alkyne that's internal, because you'll end up with this mixture of isomers. And who wants to get a mixture of isomers? <clears throat> but we can take either of these. It doesn't matter which one. They both react in the same way and add a second equivalent um, of HCl. Let me draw out the mechanism for addition of that second equivalent. So now when we add that second equivalent of HCl, here's the mechanism. I didn't show you the mechanism for the first addition. And it's the same arrow pushing if I use the Z isomer. And the product that you get out of this has a carbocation next to a halogen. And we'll talk about that in just a moment here because that may look strange to you. What does that mean? Is that a secondary carbocation? Is that more stable than secondary or less stable than secondary? We'll talk about that in just a second. And then that chloride anion attacks that carbocation and that's why you get the geminal dichloride. 
So again, this second edition of HCL occurs in what you would call a Markonikov fashion again. It will give the more substituted carbocation and uh, from an empirical point of view, you can consider the chlorine just like an alkyl substituent. In other words, you generate the more substituted carbocation, whether it's substituted with methyl or chlorine. Okay, so what's up with that, uh, with that carbocation that has a halogen next door? Let's talk about the effect of halogens in general. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to compare two different four carbon compounds, butyne. And if you take butyne and you react that with HCl, there's an addition of HCl across the double bond and I'm not going to draw the full mechanism there. Um, but if you compare the rates, what would what would happen if I compared the rates of addition? So you'd get as a product of this, <clears throat> this, um, this vinyl chloride here. Plus you'd also get the other isomer. You'd get the Z isomer as well. I'm only going to draw one of those isomers. Um, actually, I, just so you don't worry about that later, I'll go ahead and write plus. This is the E isomer, so you also get plus the Z isomer as well. The point is that if you've got, still have HCl floating around, the next molecule of HCl that comes along has to make a choice. Should I add to the alkyne starting material or should I start adding to the product as it forms? Which is faster? And it turns out that that chlorine has an electron withdrawing effect. And so this second addition of HCl is slower than the first one. That's why you can stop adding one equivalent of HCl across a double bond. If the second addition were faster, every single alkyne would immediately add a second equivalent of HCl and you wouldn't be able to stop at one addition. So um, the first addition is faster. The second addition is slower. So if you wanted, you can just add one equivalent of HCl and it will just add once and you're, you, you can stop at a single addition. Okay, let's talk about the, um, the carbocation that you generate if you do throw in a second equivalent of HCl. Let's draw this carbocation that has a halogen attached there because I don't think it looks anything like anything you've seen before. And I want to talk about two contrasting effects of that halogen atom on there. So what does that mean if you have a carbocation and one of the substituents is halogen? The problem with, with atoms like like chlorine or oxygen or nitrogen is that there's two completely different and opposite effects and you don't know which of those effects is going to win in terms of carbocation stabilization. I think the first and most obvious effect to me is that chlorine is electronegative. You know there's all these protons in the nucleus of chlorine that's what electronegativity is about. There's all these protons with a positive charge they all have positive charges in chlorine and they hate being next to this carbocation that has a positive charge. So that's an effect of electronegativity. The fact that chlorine is electronegative stabilizes, sorry, destabilizes the car uh, carbocation, right? You don't want to have electronegative atoms next to carbocations. But there's a second effect of halogens or nitrogen or oxygen and that is that they have lone pairs on them. Let me draw those lone pairs and it only takes one but I'm going to draw all three just to emphasize it. So there's a second effect and that second effect is that the lone pairs stabilize the carbocation by donating into that empty p orbital. On the one hand chlorine destabilizes the carbocation, on the other hand the, the lone pairs on chlorine stabilize it. Which one wins? It's the lone pair stabilization that wins. So overall this is more stable than a similar substrate that has no chlorine there. And so that's why if you have this kind of vinyl chloride and you add a proton to that, that's why you add the proton to the less substituted carbon. What you do not do is you don't add the proton to the carbon, whoops. 
to the carbon that already has the chlorine on it because this would be a less stable carbocation. Okay, so that's why you get Markovnikov addition. Okay, I'm going to stop there. When we come back on Friday, be here early. Be here at 10 till so you can take a seat because if, 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 you're, if we're not in our seats with our exams on time, then we're going to start later and we have to be out of here for the next class on Friday. <laughs>